We are honored by the decision of Bloomberg to entrust Ghana with the opportunity of ensuring that Africa and beyond converge on the shores of Ghana to a discourse on how best to maintain a flourishing media landscape and how business and financial journalism can best contribute to sustainable development on the African continent. Ladies and gentlemen, it has taken us some time for a consensus to emerge in our country and indeed increasingly in the rest of the continent that democracy is our preferred form of governance. It has the best prospects of ensuring the rapid and sustainable development of our nations and putting African countries on the path of progress and prosperity. Actually, there was a time in Africa when most countries were one-party states and everybody had to belong to that party. Not so long ago, all radio and television stations and newspapers were exclusively owned by the government. If you wanted to hear any voice in opposition, any voice other than the official voice, you would probably have to tune into a foreign radio station like the BBC. Unfortunately, most of our youth are unaware that until recently, a culture of silence used to reign in most parts of the continent. We're not quite there yet, but there is far more self-confidence among Africans today than there has been since the very early days of self-government and independence. Today, a new Africa is emerging that is strengthening the determination of Africans to build a new African civilization, governed by the rule of law, respect for individual liberties and human rights, and the principles of democratic accountability. But my friends, it is not enough to hold successful elections every four years or to be able to criticize the government and to have a choice of 100 radio stations. The biggest challenge that we continue to face is widespread poverty. And until we eradicate widespread poverty, Africa really cannot join the International Committee of Nations on an equal basis. We in Africa have a great battle to fight and win. And that is the battle to provide our people with a good, dignified quality of life. The structure of economies bequeathed to us by colonialism was aimed at servicing its aims, essentially raw material producing and exporting economies. The time is long overdue for us to take a deep look at these structures and transform our economies to serve better our own needs. The era of Africa's industrialization has dawned so that we can also trade in the world economy, not on the basis of raw materials, but on the basis of things we make. Trade between us and Africa is minimal, and our share of world trade is negligible. We have to improve both substantially. The good Lord has blessed our lands, and we should exploit our resources to benefit our peoples. The 2015 statistics in Ghana, which saw us spending 2.2 billion United States dollars on food imports, the same amount of money we earn from our cocoa exports, are nothing short of scandalous. We cannot afford to repeat such statistics. This is where the media, and indeed business and financial journalism can help play important parts. Media has always been a critical feature of the political, financial, and business architecture of Africa, and continues to be so. The time has come for us to harness the full potential of the media keep it up to pace with technological changes so it helps define and at the same time contribute to the sustainable development of the African continent. Over the years, African media practitioners have faced many challenges ranging from a, 
a highly polarized media environment, lack of technological support, limited investment in the sector, poorly paid journalists, threat to their lives, corruption, and lack of requisite training. These challenges have led to the African media largely shirking its responsibility in telling the African story. As a result, the narrative has been shaped and told by foreign journalists through their own lenses and words. The projection of the continent as a result has often been about war, disease, poverty, and famine. African journalists therefore have a duty to help change the image about Africa and establish a narrative which is more positive. The externally generated story of Africa might be hard to take, but so long as there's widespread poverty and inequality, that will be the image that is going to be portrayed. This means the you, our writers, our journalists from the continent, the writers of the African story, carry a great responsibility. When you write, what you write must be about the limitless possibilities on the continent. What is written about Africa by African writers must have the ultimate reference status. African writers play remarkable roles in the liberation of our continent from imperialism. They set the tone for the discourse about our identity. It is now for you, our business and financial journalists, to set the tone for the economic development and prosperity of Africa. When our young people do not see a future in their countries and cross the Sahara Desert on foot and drown in the Mediterranean in a desperate bid to reach the mirage of a better life in Europe, no amount of beautiful lyrics will change our image. When our economies grow and improve, our young people get educated and are self-confident and full of hope. The world finds its way to our doors and the language and history of our countries become attractive to our own and foreign universities. When African economies improve and there's increasing prosperity, we will find that more and more people will become interested to invest in our continent, resulting in thriving economies and the creation of progressive and prosperous nations. Undoubtedly, technological advancement and innovations will help change the face of Africa's media. These advancements, with a strong focus on di digital media and the use of social media, will ensure that the news and information about our continent, especially about its potential, will become more accessible and readily available. They will present us with even more greater control as we are now able to tell our own story. That is why the B Bloomberg Media Initiative in Africa is a great initiative to help build the capacity of Africa's media. This program, I'm confident, will deepen the capacity of our media and equip them with the relevant skill set to tell the African story, the story of potential triumph over adversity, economic successes over failure, and initiatives that will lead to the sustainable development of the continent. For example, through your work, financial and business journalists on the continent need to bring to the attention of African governments and decision makers why the promotion of business-friendly environments that reward creativity and enterprise and those who play by the rules is the effective way of sustaining development in Africa. The need to understand that the way to building that environment is when government and regulatory policies enhance rather than inhibit or frustrate trade, commerce, and investments. Promoting the rule of law by our governments assures and gives confidence to the investor community that their investments will be safe. When we master the narrative, we can then effectively tell the story about the looting of Africa and the huge amounts of illicit funds that flow from our continent, funds 
which if we were able to control, would be available to finance the development of the continent. The Ghanaian media has been very active in tackling the social ills of our country and advocating for the investment that will contribute to the sustainable development of the country. This generation of African media practitioners has to be the generation that refuses to be either pawn or victim and accepts to travel down the path of genuine popular empowerment, which represents the strongest guarantee of our independence and sovereignty. Freedom of expression, encompassing media freedom, is a critical element of that journey, which we must guard jealously at all times. There is a lot of talk that this will be the Asian century, this Chinese century, Take it from me, the 21st century holds excellent prospects for Africa. This can be Africa's century. We can claim it if we believe in ourselves. Once again, I thank Bloomberg Media Initiative for this opportunity and wish you successful deliberations throughout the course of this event. Since you were talking about youth in particular and, and the initiatives that are necessary for youth, can you discuss some of your own thoughts, policies that relate to innovation, entrepreneurship with respect to youth? Well, first of all, um, I think that the statement about being the youngest continent has so many ramifications. The obvious one is that if this young population is not put to constructive activity, it holds the possibility of considerable instability, incoherence in the future of our continent. So it's key for the orderly development of our society. But at the same time, of course, it means the, a great opportunity exists if we can harness that energy in a very constructive manner. What we're doing here in Ghana is trying to focus the attention of our young people on two key areas of our national life. Because we believe that improvement in, in the development of these two key areas is in fact the key to a future prosperous Ghana. One, the development of our agriculture. And secondly, of course, of our industrial development. And the two main programs that we have launched, one is the public sector program. We have something we call the Youth Employment Agency, which is responsible for harnessing uh, youth uh, in several areas of publicly supported activities. I mean, the agency this year is poised to complete the year by employing some 60,000 people. Then you have the private sector initiative that is also supported by uh, the public sector. We have a national entrepreneurship and innovation plan that we've been able to establish with a relatively modest seed figure of some 10 million United States dollars, whose job it is is to identify, start up businesses by young people, businesses that are going in the early stages, and support them. Support them not just with money, but with assessing uh, technical assistance, generally improving the quality in which they can do their business. I believe it's um, potentially a very important development for us, especially if they're able to convince investors to leverage on the basis of this $10 million more monies to help us develop. And the accent there is on encouraging youth entrepreneurship. And you're doing so because you are also attempting to get youth to master all of these the modern instruments of communication that all of us know about, especially the digital. The third plank is the effort to re-engage our youth in our agriculture. One of the big problems is that we here in Ghana, and I believe that story is a story across the continent, is of course so many young people 
are leaving the countryside, coming to the cities, and in the process are jeopardizing the prospects of medium to long term agricultural development. So we have put together a very big program. We call it Planting for Food and Jobs, which is once again a public sector supported program to be able to stimulate again agricultural development in the country. Initially, 200,000 farmers have been targeted in the program, and they're getting a package of supports, of inputs, of fertilizers, insecticides, and crucially also assistance from extension officers. For a long time, they've been out of the scene because they couldn't get employed. They're being employed now to assist our farmers. We believe that with this opening, we intend to scale up the numbers of farmers who are involved in the, in, 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 in the program from 200,000. Hopefully, by the end of uh, my, my, my term, the, the, the 2000 and 2021, we'll have about a million Ghanaian farmers involved in the project. And this million, I'm hoping, will be uh, for a lot of young people will be involved in it. We live in a country which has got tremendous um, uh, amounts of arable land, we have lots of water, and yet we're having to import all our food. And that, that equation is not right. I think I mentioned it in my speech, that the last official statistics that we have for 2015 had us uh, spending all our export proceeds on importing a station of food. That is, is not correct. And I think that if we are able to get this program working properly, it becomes a source of attracting the youth population to get involved. And these are some of the measures that we're taking. So I wouldn't be remiss uh, if I didn't ask you your priorities since you took office. The, the most important is to get our economy working again. Uh, last year, uh, the Ghanaian economy grew at, what, 3.6%, which is the lowest it has been for over 20 years. The, the, you know, with the population growing at nearly 3%, you know what that means. It means stagnation. So the measures that are needed to get our economy going again, trying to rationalize the, the manner in which resources are being allocated so that we can get resources into industry and agriculture as a real key. Uh, parts of our, of, those are what has been my major focus. At the same time, the important social interventions that we have made. We take the view that today's knowledge economy requires that all our young people get educated. The transition of Ghanaian youth from junior high school education to secondary education has been very poor. In the last five years, every year, more than 100,000 young people who qualify for senior secondary education drop out of the system, not because of qualification, but because their parents can't afford it. So you have had over 500,000 in the last five years. And I mean, if you just keep at a constant rate, and that progression goes on, we're looking at a million young people over the course of 10 years who are thrown into the social market with the, the skills of junior high school education. You and I know that those are not the skills to survive in a competitive 21st century environment. So we have decided to take the burden of senior secondary school education onto the state. We're now making uh, senior high school education in Ghana and the public school system free. It has had already a dramatic impact. This year, 90,000 more students have entered senior high school education than they did the equivalent time last year because of this policy. So that's going on, and uh, we're also making, taking important decisions about reviving our national health insurance scheme. We had a, a very progressive um, insur health insurance scheme that my former boss, John Kufour, established for the country when we were in office the first time in 2001. Um, it went, like many things in the country, pear-shaped in the hands of its successors. 
but we're now reviving and strengthening the scheme. So those are also part of the package, the mix of things. Yes, the focus on the real sectors of the economy are there, but at the same time, important social reforms are also being made to be able to support that. So we've got health, we've got education. Those are two pillars. And then there's got to be a third pillar somewhere, industrial policy of some sort. Yes. And that is? Absolutely. Um, in itself also in two parts. We have a district industrialization program, which we had, we've dubbed the One District, One Factory Initiative, which is to identify for the 216 districts in the country uh, industrial possibilities in each district. They are there. This is a, a, a blessed land, Ghana. Uh, in, in every part of the country, there are all kinds of uh, resources that can lend themselves easily to in, in industrial activity, especially with the backing of governments. We're not talking about establishing state enterprises. We're talking about promoting private sector activity in these 216 districts. And at the same time, recognizing that we also need important large-scale industrial growth goals. We've identified three areas of, 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 of activity of importance to us. One, the exploitation of our bauxite resources. We have considerable bauxite resources in the western region of our country, in Awasu, in Ashanti, in the north, and happily also from where I come from, in Tibi. Uh, uh, <coughs> so you can understand the pressure on me to do something about those resources. So, um, uh, and also do so in terms of looking at the entire value chain of establishing a refinery, establishing a smelter, an aluminum, then as well as the transformation into aluminum. They say aluminum is the metal of the future, but we have a lot of the raw material here, and we, we are determined to now exploit it in a comprehensive manner. The same with our iron and steel, steel deposits. We have considerable iron ore deposits in Ghana, in the western region, in the northern part of our country. That also is part of the focus. And then, of course, Insofar as we have considerable gas resources in our country, we want to bring it into play with the petrochemical, the development of petrochemical industry. So it's, a, it's an ambitious program. Um, I'm not sure whether in four years I'll be able to do it all, but I want to give it a big shot and see what, what, what can be done. So I regret that our, our time with you has come uh, equally to a close, me, yeah. but Your Excellency, I want to thank you for sharing your perspective with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.